Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Bible. We thank you that it's your word and uh, that it's living and active and it speaks to us. And we pray that you would speak to each and every one of us here tonight, whatever it is that you want to say. And give us, Lord, open hearts and minds to be able to receive your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, it was the summer after my A-levels, and uh, friends and I went on a holiday to Cornwall, to the south coast of Cornwall, to Polroon, which is a little fishing village. And um, we booked this mackerel fishing trip. I was super excited, thinking, great, we're going to go home with this massive catch, and it's going to be a delicious um, supper. Now, we were fishing for quite a while, and nothing happened. We didn't catch a single thing. Um, but that actually didn't bother me as much as the the constant bobbing of the boat, that lulling that kind of makes you just feel more queasy. So although I was disappointed that we hadn't caught anything up until that point, I was more concentrating on, on, concentrating on that. And uh, eventually, that led me to contribute more to the ocean <laughs> than I had taken from it at that point. And then what was really weird was when the fish then appeared, <laughs> obviously totally delighted in this new bait that I had provided. But that whole experience taught me that I am not a natural fit for the fishing industry. And uh, I found the whole trip a massive endurance test and deeply, deeply disappointing. Perhaps you've been disappointed, I imagine you have because you've been fishing, not necessarily out on a boat, on the sea, but in life, we are all called to our own fishing expeditions. It's the business that you started. It's your work, it's your lack of work, it's your search for work, it's an area of parenting. It's some area where you're investing energy and effort, investing your passion, your creativity, your talents, your skills, your into, or maybe even a person in your life. And you started off with all this hope, all this expectation of what it's going to be like. But honestly, you feel a bit discouraged and disappointed and a bit sick, forgive the pun, couldn't resist it, but a bit sick of the effort that you're putting in and not getting anything back. You keep coming up empty-handed. And there's a fisherman in scripture who knows exactly how it feels to have a deeply disappointing fishing trip. He was not on a leisure afternoon trip, but he was out all night for his livelihood and caught absolutely nothing. So if you've got your Bibles or your phone, um, turn with me to Luke chapter 5, um, or it will come up on the screen. Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. And uh, we're going to read about the story about a fisherman. And through his story, we can glean some encouragement for anyone who's ever been fishing in some area of life and felt like you've caught nothing. Verse 1. One day, as Jesus was standing at the lake of Gennesaret. Now, if, you're, if you've got your Bibles open, and I would encourage you, actually. I know some of you are just thinking, gosh, I've done enough to get myself here vaguely on time. I don't want to remember to bring my Bible. I just want to encourage you, bring your Bibles with you. And you can write in them, you can make notes in them, and also it means you can check that I'm not making stuff up as well. But if, you're, if you do have a Bible with you, where it says the Lake of Gennesaret, it's got a little A by it. And then if you look down, there's notes at the bottom. Well, there is in my Bible anyway, which also says that that is the Sea of Galilee. So the Lake of Gennesaret and the Sea of Galilee are the same place, and they're often used interchangeably in the Scriptures. So um, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. Now Simon at this point has already finished a long night shift. He's already discouraged. He's already disappointed but that his efforts have amounted to nothing. When Jesus sees him, so Simon has already abandoned his boat, he's left it. He's already left that which represents disappointment for him, discouragement for him. And the gospel writer, Luke, in this passage, he's wanting us to know that we can picture the scene. This is where Jesus has spotted him. And Luke says in verse 1 that there was a crowd 
And some translations of this verse say a multitude. So we're to know that this isn't just a dozen people. This isn't probably even a few hundred. It's potentially a few thousand people gathering around Jesus. And the gospel accounts tell us that when Jesus showed up, often there would be masses of people, masses of people would gather around to listen to him. And now the crowds, they didn't necessarily believe that he was who he said he was. They didn't necessarily believe that. And yet they knew that when Jesus showed up, when Jesus was in the room, stuff happened. They knew that the deaf ears could hear, that the lame could walk, that the blind could see, that the dead were raised when Jesus was around. They'd also heard good teaching before. They'd had rabbis, they'd had good Jewish leaders who would give good teaching, but they'd never heard words spoken with the authority in which Jesus had spoken. So when Jesus showed up, the crowds were there. And Luke wants to make sure that we understand as we're reading this passage that this wasn't a relaxed group of people just chilling out by the beach. There was this hustle, this bustle crowding around Jesus, and he was backed up against the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Then we look in verse 2. It says, he saw one man who'd had a tough night fishing. Know today, wherever you're at, in the busyness, in the chaos of life, the crowd around you, that God sees you. Your discouraging, your disappointing fishing trip has not been lost on God. And maybe the truth is that nobody else would really know it. Maybe your parents don't know. Maybe your spouse doesn't know. Maybe your children doesn't, don't know. Maybe your neighbors don't know. Maybe you present really well in front of others, your friends, at church even. Maybe you're thinking, actually, I look like I've got it all together, but I'm desperately, desperately disappointed and struggling to hold it together. But I want you to know today that God is a God who sees. That's what this passage tells us, that in the midst of this story, he sees. In fact, that's a name in the Old Testament for God, the God who sees. In the, in the book of Genesis, at the beginning of the Bible, in the Old Testament, there's a story about a lady called Hagar, and she, she gives him that name, El Roy, the God who sees. But he cares about you, and he cares about everything that concerns you. All the stuff that keeps you awake at night in the early hours. All the things that maybe sometimes are the stuff that means that you're crying yourself to sleep at night. God cares, God sees, and he knows. It talks in the Psalms that he says, you've put my tears in a bottle, the psalmist says. Knowing that makes a difference to me. Knowing that makes a difference to how I pray. The God who created the universe who Martin read about in Revelation, the God in heaven, he cares and he knows and he sees you. Moving on to verse three. He, that's Jesus, he gets into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asks him to put out a little from the shore. Jesus got into the very thing that was discouraging and disappointing for Simon. The very thing that Simon was trying to move away from, Jesus gets right in to the very heart of it. And so often, I think, Jesus, I know, Jesus will use those parts of our lives that we think are worthless or useless, and he uses it for his glory. Could it be that Jesus already knew that there was going to be a crowd there that morning? Do you think that in his sovereignty, he was aware that there were going to be people gathering around him and that he was going to have to try and find a way of speaking to them so that they could all hear him. Along the shore of Capernaum, the northern side of the Sea of um, Galilee, there's a sequence of steep inlets, like a zigzagging shoreline. And uh, they form like a, a natural amphitheater. And still today, if you were to go to Israel, you can see that. And if you were to get in a boat, pull out a little from the shore, and just speak in a sort of natural, natural level, natural tone, um, people on the shore would be able to hear you. So Jesus knew that the geography of the area would help him speak to the crowd. But what he needed was the availability of a boat. It says, then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. Could it be that sometimes God in his sovereignty allows the circumstances around us to make space for Jesus? 
perhaps that unsuccessful venture at work, the relationship that didn't work out, the qualifications that didn't open the door like we'd hoped? Could it be that those disappointments could actually provide an opportunity for us to see what it looks like when Jesus plants his feet, as it were, in the very deck of our lives? In verse 4, it says, When he'd finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Now, despite the bad night that they'd had, unlike me, Simon and his partners were fishermen, and they were experienced in their trade. They weren't some kind of like rookie upstarts. They weren't temp workers. This is what they did. This is what they knew. I've done different temp jobs. I have worked in a garden center. I've um, worked as a waitress in a restaurant, working as a waitress in a cocktail bar. It's for the 80s kids. What's that? Human League. Oh, we've turned, we've turned pop quiz all of a sudden. <laughs> um, what else have I done? I've done, I've put plastics on a conveyor belt for hours on end with a great bunch of people. I have worked as a dinner lady in a school and the kids told me that I was too tall to be, in a, be a dinner lady, so they gave me quite a bit of grief, which I thought was quite hurtful. <laughs> and um, what else? A toy demonstrator. I've been a toy demonstrator, actually. That was quite humiliating at one point because there was a game that's called Butthead and you put this cap on, it's got Velcro on it, and then someone has to throw a ball at it and it sticks to your head and you get various points, but I was 18 at the time, and you had these 19-year-old boys coming, and I felt like incredibly insecure that they were actually then throwing stuff at me. Just picture the scene and then pray for my healing. <laughs> Obviously still struggling. But you know, in all these jobs, I was just filling in. This was just, that was just a temporary thing. These guys weren't filling in. This was their area, this was their business. Fishing was their livelihood. If they didn't catch anything, they didn't make any money. And they could be worried at this time, the lack of fish from the sea, that this was perhaps an indication, maybe, of heading towards recession. And Simon knew that he knew a lot more about fishing than Jesus, because Jesus was a carpenter by trade. He was a builder. He was in construction. He worked with stone, with metal, with wood, not with fish. Also, possibly, conscious of being mocked by the other fishermen on the shore, questioning Simon's professional judgment, because the best time to catch fish was at night, and the best place was in the shoreline, in the shallow water. He was probably feeling a bit unsure about Jesus' instruction. And then here's Jesus telling him to launch out in daylight in deep water. It didn't make sense. Simon answered, verse 5, Master, we've worked hard all night and we haven't caught anything. He's saying to Jesus, I don't want to. I don't feel like it. I don't think this is going to work. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. Simon was out of his depth. Physically, he was out of his depth in deep water. Professionally, you know, Jesus was saying the exact opposite to something that his professional experience was telling him. And spiritually, because he had to choose to trust Jesus even when his leading him didn't really seem to make any sense to him whatsoever. In verse 6, it's where they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So Simon, in this story, he throws the net out. He does something. He actually takes part in the miracle. He plays a part because he's being active, playing an active role in that miracle. And I look at this, and I look at this story, and I think, but what's the difference? What's the difference between the period when they couldn't catch anything to then the moment when they had way too many fish, more than they could even handle? How did these guys go from nothing to complete abundance? It's the same lake, it's the same boat, it's the same fisherman, it's the same fish. The difference between empty nets and abundance was Jesus' presence in the boat. It was a game changer. They were no longer fishing by themselves. God was in their boat. And suddenly, the water that had previous before been lifeless and fruitless the night before is now teeming with fish abundantly. 
They, ca they caught more fish in those 10 minutes than they had in the previous 10 hours. What God does in this story, he shows us that he can take what is a, um, a setback and he can turn it into a comeback. He can take a weary night into a wonder-filled day. Simon lets Jesus use his boat as a platform for Jesus' purposes and Jesus' ministry. We all have our own boats. What, what's your boat? What is the thing that Jesus is just saying, is it available? Are you available? It's your workplace. It's your school. It's your home. It's wherever you spend your days, in your neighborhood. Those are our boats. And do we say yes? Do we actually, at the beginning of every day, say yes? Yes to Jesus. Use my boat, whatever that is. Use my boat for your purposes and your ministry. For Simon, it was out in the deep, arguably out of his comfort zone, that he then experienced this life-changing miracle. When we say yes to God, when we respond to his call, even when we're out in deep water, even when we feel like it's way above our head, it is far better than being in the shallow water, standing on our own two feet. In the shallow water, you can see one perspective. When you're out in the deep, you see the presence of God and the power of God at work. Shallow water is more comfortable, but the fish, they're not in the shallow water. They're not there. They're in the uncomfortable place. In verse 7, it says, So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came, and they filled both boats so full that they began to sink. And what I find interesting when you read this passage is that Simon doesn't yell out. He doesn't shout out. He signals. And that, to me, says that he was probably just totally dumbstruck by what has just seen, what's before him. He couldn't even speak. That actually he's just signaling for his um, partners to come over. He's totally blown away in the process. And not only do they catch enough fish for themselves, but they catch up enough for people to, to share with others. God gives them enough to share. In verse 8, it says, When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at his, Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. They left everything. You know, at the moment in their career where their profession was prospering in their hands, they left it. They left it all behind. They left this miraculous catch of fish because they were captivated, they were compelled, they were convinced that there was nothing worth more than following Jesus and giving their lives to him. And I wonder, this has made me think, and I wonder for you, when was the last time that you were made almost speechless by the presence or the provision of God in your life? When was the last time that you were astonished at his presence? That so much so that you just had to share it with those around you. On the 19th of September 2021, a friend of ours called Josh, um, he's a vicar actually just in, in London, was diagnosed with brain cancer. And uh, the operation to move it was, was very complicated because it wasn't um, a mass, it was more like a net that was over his brain. And uh, the surgeons tried to take out as much as they could without damaging the brain itself. In July, he started chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And on Bank Holiday Monday, he went to get some scans, the results of some scans, to see how his treatment had been progressing. And now, there's a WhatsApp group that Martin and I and others are a part of that when he, he just puts updates on there, so we know how to pray, trying to pray specifically, trying to pray faithfully that this young guy with... Um, three lovely, young, gorgeous kids, and that the Lord would heal him, and the Lord would, um, yeah, just move, move, and, and give, give peace in his heart, and, and heal him from this cancer. And uh, it was, it's a very aggressive kind, and so what they were expecting 
in the results was either that the cancer would stay the same, there might be some little improvement, but they were anticipating that it actually might be quite a bit worse. And uh, back holiday Monday, he went for an appointment, got the results, and we received this message on this WhatsApp group, and Josh has given me permission to share this little video with you tonight. Hey everyone, Josh and Daisy here. Um, thanks so much for your prayers. I've just been into the hospital this morning at the Royal Marsden right now um, and just come out of the appointment just to look at the review of the MRI scan and um, went into the appointment qu quite late. They're, they're busy. It's um, bank holiday Monday and um, so uh, I had to go in and take a blood test, go, go into the room and um, the the consultant was asking how I am, how am I feeling? Um, and I just said to her, look, I'm, I'm feeling okay, but I don't want to unpack this too much. If you've got something else to share about where I'm at, what's going on um, with uh, the glioma and the cancer. And um, she's like, well, let me show you on the screen. And um, unbelievably, uh, the, the cancer's reduced unbelievably. It's, it's almost completely gone. And um, uh, she, she, she said a few things. Daisy, you, you say them because you're much better at remembering them than me. <laughs> um, so she said, the scan looks really good. And um, we've been praying for so long, like, let her say, this is better than I expected. Um, and, and we walked in and she just said, um, this is not what I expected to see at all. She said, when I looked at the scan, I just I got excited. Um, she said, I very rarely see this in scans. Um, she said, so right now, this is really positive news for this, uh, like at this stage of treatment. When she said that, I stood up, threw my arms in the air, pra praising Jesus, because honestly, the, the, the impact of our faith and um, the proximity of Jesus, filling with the Holy Spirit each day, especially over the last six weeks, has been unbelievable. And um, just on fire to unpack the gospel with people because you know they had no expectation of this. They are surprised by it, and so many of you have been praying for us and praying for healing, and the Lord's the Lord's doing it. He's moving amongst us um, powerfully and in a way that even the team here don't know. Um, we know how it's happened, so we're so grateful. We love you all loads, and um, can't wait to connect. Yeah. Amazing, isn't it? Amazing. And I spoke to Josh yesterday and he said it's been a tricky week because they don't know what the future holds and no one lives forever. Um, but right now, they feel such a sense of God's peace and seeing the miraculous. And of course, all the messages on the WhatsApp group were just like, wow, amazing, praise God, praise God, this is amazing. And when I spoke to him yesterday, he said to me, my faith is next level. I've known the Lord in ways that I've never known him before. And he said, our lives are changed. He said, rather than getting obsessed by things, our attention and our investment is on him, is on Jesus. And Josh said that people and groups of people all over the world are coming to faith in Jesus because of this story. And he said, Daisy and I are praying every day, Lord, what are you doing among us? What are you doing among us? And essentially, what is a deeply, has been a deeply difficult roller coaster of a journey so far for them it's like that's their boat they're saying in their disappointment in their discouragement they're saying lord what are you doing among us today and god is at work he is moving and he is moving in power when we experience the miraculous power of god at work in our lives we are compelled to share it we're compelled to share it with those around us and Simon, in this passage, he himself witnessed the healing of his mother-in-law. If you just read back uh, just at the end of chapter 4, we can see that Jesus healed his mother-in-law from a fever, literally just before we read this story about him and the miraculous catch of fish. For Simon, like my friends Josh and Daisy, encountering Jesus totally changed his life. And then further on in the New Testament, we read that Simon Peter drops a name. He ditches a name, and he just is called Peter. 
And uh, he's known as this, he becomes this great preacher, this incredible church leader and pastor and evangelist, so much so that there's an account in Acts, in the book of Acts, that says three, that over 3,000 people gave their lives to Jesus in just one day. A miraculous catch of fish, just as Jesus had said. He's faithful to his promises. Could it be that God is speaking to you today to prepare you to step out into the deep, whatever that might look like for you, whatever routine you currently find yourself in? And I think about what Martin was saying about carrying all those, you know, 40 cards and not giving them out to his footy mates because he was like, oh gosh, I don't know how we're going to do this, but I, I can't help but think that with Alpha coming up in just 10 days' time, maybe this week is an amazing opportunity. Maybe the Lord is wanting to say there's a miraculous catch of fish out there. Will we be like Simon and take part in the miracle and let down our nets again? Hand out those invitations. Not just invite, but say, come, come with me. Come and bring them along to Alpha. Because even if we share our disappointments, our discouragements, which we all have, but then how we meet Jesus in the midst of that, that could be that hope and that help for others to say, he can meet you where you're at too. I've got this friend called Tom, and uh, he doesn't really go to church. In fact, he doesn't go to church at all. And I invited him to Alpha, and uh, he said no. And then next time Alpha came around, I invited him again and said, oh, Tom, Alpha's coming, um, it's just about to start, would you like to come? And he said no. And um, I invited him about six times in a row, and he just said no. So then I thought, gosh, what if I just changed my approach? So then I said to him, Tom, how do you feel about the fact that I keep inviting you to Alpha? And then he said, well, The fact that you keep inviting me makes me think it's something that I should do. So he came. So he came. He came to Alpha, and he did most of the course. He didn't become a Christian. I wouldn't say yes, and he gave his life to Jesus, but he is definitely on a journey. But it took asking again and again and again. And I felt like Simon in the story. Lord, I've I've let down the nets all night and caught nothing. But he says to us, let down your nets again. And I read a stat the other day around, around Alpha, and it says um, that 23% of people have heard of Alpha. So that means 77% have never heard of it. And I don't know about you, but sometimes you sort of think, oh, sure, surely most people have heard. You think, gosh, 77% of people have never heard of Alpha, the opportunity to come and to explore Jesus, who he is, what's the meaning of life. of those who have heard of Alpha have been invited. But that means 56% of people who have heard of it have never been invited. They've never been invited to come and take part. A few years ago, my oldest son, Jack, was at sixth form, and at school, he said to his head teacher, please can I run Alpha in the sixth form here? And they said no. A little while later, he said, "Um, would it be okay if I started a Christian union in my sixth form? And they said yes, to which the first thing he did was run Alpha. (laughs) And then um, he was telling me that over the course of his time in that sixth form, over 90% of his sixth form came to Alpha. Over 90%. That's like most of his year group. (laughs) You guys know what 90% is, close to 100 (laughs) 90 percent, most of his year group came through the course. Some people became Christians, not everybody. Some people became Christians, and that was amazing, and they're still walking with the Lord today. Others are on a journey, a bit like we heard in Becca's story, are on a journey, it's a process, not necessarily one instant thing. Ethan, I, can, I, can I borrow you really quickly? Where's the mic? Ethan and I were just chatting the other day, and um, can I, let me introduce Ethan to you properly. This is Ethan, he is... Um, <laughs> He's, he's new on the team, and he is um, our Sunday services and events coordinator. Just started here in a, a couple of weeks ago. And if you've not had a chance to get to know Ethan, come say hi to him, invite him out, take him for a beer, or and maybe, oh, is that you and me? You know, you quite like a gym session. You'd, quite, you'd be open for that, wouldn't you? Yeah. Personal, actually, you are a personal trainer, aren't you? Yeah. Anyway, we're diverting, yeah, I, diverting. Yeah. Well, I've, any, just take me out to eat. That's, yeah, take you out to eat. Oh, you'd prefer that? You'd yeah. prefer that. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> 
<laughs> anyway, I, I, I digress. Easily distracted. Um, so we were talking about Alpha the other day, yeah. and you were saying how you were involved in running a course at Alpha, yeah. and that you were inviting people in your university. Yeah. How many uh, did you invite? I invited 12. You invited 12. 12 and did all those 12 come? Yeah, the 12 came, yeah. And what, what happened? Well, um, as it be, so like, you can tell the whole story? A little uh, bit? Uh, well, well, just yeah, well, listen the, the highlights, the sure. highlights. Uh, when, while I was at university, I was like, asked to run Alpha at my church. And I hadn't even done Alpha yet. So I was just like, you want me to run something I've never done before? Sure. Um, I don't know what's going to happen. It could just be me and like, my youth leader. And it could just be us two eating pizza together. It'd be fine if that happened. But um, because I was studying at the time, I was in student accommodation, I ended up doing Alpha the first night and absolutely loved it. So I'd come back every Wednesday evening and I'd go into student accommodation and I'd, had, I'd have to go through the community bit. And so they'd always see me, it's like, Ethan, where have you been? I'm like, guys, I just had free food, had a great night, you guys gotta check it out. And I came back like every single Wednesday on like this hype and everyone saw it and they were like, Ethan, can we, can we come along? I'm like, yeah, come along. And as it be, so I started inviting 12 people and those 12 came. As, you know, as, I can only give glory to God for this, but as it, near the end of the course, the whole student accommodation came. So that was 80 um, students. So you invited 12, yeah. but 80 turned 80 up. 80 turned up. I mean, that is a pretty miraculous yeah. catch of fish, is it not? Yeah, I mean, the best part was like, they're students, and the, the accommodation was in South London, Tooting, and my church was in Westminster, and they booked Ubers. And that was what baffled me. I'm like, how can you afford Ubers? Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I'm like, yeah, okay, God is providing some people. Um, with, yeah. yeah, amazing. Yeah, Thank so. you, Ethan. Thanks. I just was so encouraged. I thought that was such a brilliant thing, you know, that he invited 12, but then 80 turned up. Absolutely amazing. And actually, just, you know, the last couple of weeks, talking to different ones at church, people who've been invited, saying, why don't you come? Why don't you come to church? They turn up and say, well, I've come because I've been invited by somebody. And then, you know, I was chatting with a couple of people last week and say, well, why don't you come and do Alpha? And they're coming. They're going to come, and they've signed up already because somebody has invited them. And maybe, like my friend Tom, there is one person that you have invited to Alpha before and they haven't yet come and uh, perhaps you're feeling discouraged and you're thinking I cannot ask one more time what will they think of me keep going on well then just remember my story with Alpha maybe change the question how do you feel about that I keep asking you to do Alpha and see what happens because it's a great place where we can meet God and uh, yeah, perhaps that's the word for us today. Go out into the deep water again and let down your nets. And as we saw in Luke 5, the difference between empty nets and abundance is the presence of Jesus in the boat. And people coming to know Jesus is always a work of God. We get to play a part because we invite, we say, come follow me as we follow Christ. But it's always a work of God. And that's why we do the 21 days of prayer. That's why we're running that campaign right up into, um, until Alpha starts on October the 5th. Because we're praying. We want to, we've set our alarms for Luke 11, o two, um, Luke 11, chapter 2. 11.02 is when I've set my alarm. So that it goes off and then I know that I'm, I'm praying for three people that I want to be able to say, give me an opportunity to have a conversation about, about Jesus. And then and perhaps invite them to come to Alpha. Because we know that prayer is the thing that makes a difference. And actually one of the things that I thought was interesting that shifted um, in my conversations with Tom is that I'd, com I'd committed for one year to pray and fast every Monday for that year, praying for him and a number of others that they might come to Jesus, that they might come to Alpha. So I just find it interesting that after I'd made that commitment, he actually then turned around and said, yeah, I'll come, I'll check it out. And he is definitely on this journey. It's always a work of God. And um, we just want to be people who say, when the Lord says, let down your nets again, that we can say, yes, Lord, even if it feels like I'm out into the deep, because there's no greater value in life than following him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you love each one of us. Thank you, Lord, that you know our story, you know our struggles, you know our disappointment our inadequacies, and I just pray now for those of us here in the room who are currently experiencing such an acute level of discouragement and disappointment. I pray that you come by your spirit. Come and fill them with your peace. I pray that your presence would draw close. 
and that they would know that you see them. And Lord, I thank you that you use even the parts of our lives that feel um, useless and worthless. But thank you, Lord, that when we venture into the deep, what feels like sometimes risky places of invitation or whatever it might be, that you use it and we can trust in you. So, Lord, we pray that you would do a miracle, that you would do miracles in the very environments that seem hostile or inhospitable to your presence. Lord, we just thank you that you are, as Josh said in that video, you are at work, you are moving among us. Give us open eyes to see and give us courage to step out into the deep and say yes to you. Lord, that we might see you at work in our lives, in, in our church and across this city and nation, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.